Welcome everyone to another episode of Architect Tomorrow. I'm really excited about this one. We're going to be talking about cloud native security, uh, trusted computing, confidential computing, and I'm really pleased to have a couple of guests with me. Before I, we go into intros, I just want to put out a disclaimer that, uh, as usual, this is our own personal views, uh, not the views of any current or former employer. But with that out of the way, um, Christoph, thanks very much for joining Architect Tomorrow. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm very glad to be here. And perhaps, Christoph, you can give us a, a, a brief uh, bit of your sort of background. I know I I came across you because you were doing some great posts on uh, cloud Thank security. You. I'm a cloud security architect, and I've been involved in um, cloud transformation for seven, eight years now. So I'm um, essentially focused on Azure, but I also I cover a bit of AWS, as you have probably seen. Uh, so I was very fortunate to be involved in the early uh, design of uh, some critical aspects of uh, Azure security. So I was in, involved in, in, in the design of Azure Policy, Azure Firewall. And so since uh, those days, uh, I've been keeping working on cloud native security, how uh, things like Azure Policy can bring uh, a native posture to your environment uh, by native, and I, I mean, essentially, uh, uh, protective before defensive, uh, mm -hmm. before detection, protect before detect, because it's it's much easier to protect than detect, and it's less costly. So I, 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 I've, worked, I've been working a lot on, on those topics. Now, uh, on, on, on uh, pre preventive uh, uh, security, now I've switched to other topics as well, broader topics like confidential computing, as you said, quantum computing, and of course, uh, the public cloud vulnerabilities that we've seen uh, rising over the past two years. Yeah, awesome. And uh, Pete, I think you're the second uh, colleague of mine from Scott Logic to join uh, the podcast, but I think you're the first to appear on video because um, Colin was just oh. on an audio episode. So welcome, thank you for joining. Oh, well, I hope uh, it's the new face of Scott Logic um, that I'll, uh, I'll represent the company well. Uh, I'm a principal. <laughs> A principal consultant. I lead on cybersecurity at, at Scott Logic as well, as part of the uh, technical leadership um, function. So for me, this is like absolutely in that that zone of uh, how do we understand how the cloud works now, how it works in the future, and, and what our customers are going to need in terms of security. I really enjoyed the phrase uh, "protect before detect," um, and we're definitely in a world now where we're, we've got a lot of clients talking about zero trust, moving towards that world. And you go, okay, great. H how much data are we going to store and monitor so from my perspective coming into this uh, conversation yeah this is about getting down to that low level uh low-key magic um of uh yeah security at the hardware level so yeah really looking forward to the conversation christoph so for those listening to this episode we're gonna yeah we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about sort of cloud security in general we're gonna talk about trusted computing what what does that mean uh you know what, what what's that made of we're then going to kind of dive a bit more into confidential computing and, and then ex explore the so what around that Let's kick off a bit with where where we think we are with sort of cloud security. Uh, you know, we're, we're recording this in, in January 23. So I think, you know, there's been a lot of significant moves, right? And I think no, hopefully no longer people are talking about sort of lifting and shifting, um, you know, virtual machines to infrastructure as a service. We're now, we're now I think, in, increasingly getting to that point of maturity where we're talking about cloud native services and the different sort of paradigm and operating model and security models we need to kind of consider for those types of services. But Christoph, I know you're posting about sort of vulnerabilities in cloud services quite regularly. Where, where is your sort of head on cloud security in general uh, right now? For me, if we speak about trends, uh, what I see that where we used to have um, platform as a service uh, which were very um, tied to the low-level architecture, like more like middleware and, and, and infrastructure. Now, what we see is more and more complex fast services uh, are being delivered by the cloud providers, integrated with one another. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's more looking like a uh, software as a service than pass as a service, uh, platform as a service. I mean, so there is a rise in maturity. It, it became more complex. Uh, the services which are provided are more complex. And so there are some more risks as well, because uh, the more complex the service is, the more dependency it has with other native services, the more complex it gets. We also have integration with third parties and other environments to manage. This is uh, relatively new. You know that we can perform pass to SaaS integration now. We have more tools for doing that. Uh, they are far from perfect. It's it's already very limited at the moment in what we can do in terms of uh, robust security. You have AWS AppFlow, 
which interconnect uh, with third parties. Uh, on, on Microsoft, you can uh, interconnect your PaaS with uh, the Office 365 uh, SaaS ecosystem somehow. Uh, but it's really, it's, it's, for me, it's really a fresh, a fresh, uh, uh, a fresh area to explore, and there are potential risks to address, and, and there are long, lots of things to, uh, to address in this, uh, in this regard. And I think you know, people have debated like whether cloud is more secure by default, but I, I, I think that's quite a dangerous, I personally view that's quite a dangerous position. I mean, how do you think the sort of risks change and shift from cloud as people were kind of originally using it, the sort of virtual machine type? What's the, kind of, I suppose, the, the difference in the sort of threat modeling or, or looking at the sort of landscape when it comes to sort of shifting towards sort of cloud native? Uh, I, yeah, I think that a lot of progress has been made because uh, we, we have all the privacy concerns, most of the privacy concerns related to networking uh, data at rest, which have been addressed. Uh, and so we have more and more security by design, I would say, uh, you know that we are now forced to use the data at rest encryption uh, in most cloud provider services, that's a great stuff. Uh, we, we're seeing more uh, this kind of uh, enforced enforcements uh, being uh, being uh, done by the cloud providers, but um, we see that uh, what I like about you know the many vulnerabilities which have been found uh, it's that we used to to uh, to be blind you know with regard to the internal architecture of the providers and to to trust them uh, as being very secure. Now we, we see that it's not the case. We have very detailed reports from researchers which really uh, peer through the curtain, you know. We right. can know what's going on in, inside the platforms. We have a better idea. And, uh, and also, so I think it is really positive because first uh, it's, it's uh, researchers which are uh, ethical hackers, let's say these are not dangerous people. So we are very lucky for that. So it, it raises the awareness for the customers, because we are now aware that uh, the, the cloud is not as a, a bulletproof as we imagine, and also for the, the providers as well, because they have to be more careful, they have to be more transparent on what they do, and I, I think it's it's positive. So, uh, uh, in terms of risk coverage, I, I, I'm more confident, even if we have critical risk, because I used to be blind, and now I'm not blind anymore. I have a better understanding of what I should do to protect myself and to anticipate for the risks. So I think it's a positive trend, and even if it's, it looks like uh, uh, it's, we have many critical uh, vulnerabilities. So I guess what you're saying is we've been able to sort of, uh, it's trust, trusting the cloud providers has kind of been somewhat of a bit of a blind exercise, but now we have some ability to verify. And but staying on the trust, Topic. I know one of the things we're really keen to explore is the trusted computing model, and I I, I liked the post from a couple of days ago where you have the rings, and I'll um, put the, the diagram up. But for those listening, I'll just quickly run through uh, what, what what this is. So there's a trusted computing picture that Christoph created, which has in the middle of the rings a hermetic system. Um, then we have a, an oxic system, which I'll uh, looking forward to Christoph talking a bit more about in a minute, and then a confidential system, and then outside of that, compute services and general compute services is sort of you know, the IS has the serverless sort of services that I think most people know uh, the cloud for. And I think what's interesting for me is a lot of people just think about public cloud being sort of openly exposed to the internet. And I think that it's, it's actually far more nuanced than that, isn't it? With virtual private network, it's like with uh, VPCs and so on. There are ways of uh, configuring the cloud in a way that actually it's not all kind of just connected you know, essentially outside the outside world. I think a lot of people just think public cloud, they think, oh, that's just for public facing internet services. But of course there are ways of configuring cloud differently. But what I liked about this is it goes even further and it talks about the different sort of um, models, I suppose, and, and technologies now that we can bring to bear. So um, Christoph, maybe if you can talk us through your thinking around the sort of trusted computing kind of space. Yeah, sure. First, I think that trusting compu trusted computing is not for everybody, right? As you said, uh, we have lots of privacy enhancements now in, in, the, in the public cloud with the private links, with private data at rest. So uh, we are kind of no, not internet facing really anymore. And we, are, we can have very, uh, very private environments. So, but uh, what I want to say about confidential computing is there's a lot of confusion about uh, the expectation and what it does exactly. And I think that there are several reasons for that. So before delving into, into the uh, onion rings that you mentioned before, uh, I, I just want to, 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 to explain what, what, what's so confusing about confidential computing. First, uh, 
If you look at uh, the Trusted Computing uh, um, Consortium, uh, which uh, like, is, like set standards in financial computing, you will, you will quickly realize that uh, the overwhelming number of members are vendors. It okay. means that uh, the customer voice is very little and, and very, very insignificant in, in the consortium. Uh, it is our fault, customers, because we are not enough involved in the discussions about confidential computing, but uh, at the moment it is driven by the vendors and we only have to hope that they have understand, understood our needs because in the end, we are the customer who are going to buy the products, mm -hmm. right? So let's hope that they are going into the right direction. I, I do believe that they do wonderful stuff, but there are also things that might be uh, improved. And I think for the customers, it is the proper time to jump in the bandwagon and to uh, to take part of the conversation because the longer we wait, the harder it would be, be, be to, to, you know, to steer the direction of uh, where it goes in terms of hardware. Really hard it's a really good point, I suppose, around kind of participating sort of vendor-led sort of things is that, yeah, uh, what's the value in that? Well, the value in that is sort of not, at the very least nudging, if not sort of pushing some of these standards and, uh, and um, bodies in the sort of right direction. But it's, I think it's often hard to kind of justify as an end user why your time should be spent on some of these things, right? But no, I... I, I like this sort of what you're doing because I think you're providing that voice of, of, of a customer in many cases kind of pushing back and saying, well, no, there's some things we need to think about here. But the big, the big thing for me around confidential com the com computing piece, I kind of came across it uh, a, a couple of years ago for the first time. And I thought, wow, that's, that's quite clever. And my layperson's understanding is that it's essentially a way of running workloads in the cloud in such a way that the cloud provider can't really see What's, what's kind of being processed. So it's kind of a, a secure enclave, it's a secure environment that's sort of, um, I suppose, closed off from the cloud provider through encryption. But have, what, what have I got right there and what have I got wrong? How would you, yes, how would you it's, it's, yeah, I think it's, Yeah, I think you, you nailed it. It's, uh, it's for, for me at least, the key point is what what is the threat model? What do we, what risk we want to address, right? Yep. It, it, we have to be crystal clear about it, otherwise, uh, I think the, the discussion is, is pointless. Uh, so several people have several expectations. Uh, and for me, um, we already have a lot of uh, mitigation, risk mitigation related to, uh, for example, multi-tenancy uh, uh, in, in, in the cloud. But as you said, for the provider, we, we are completely uh, exposed to, to the provider. And as I said in the beginning, uh, confidential computing is not for everybody. Uh, for maybe 90% of guys, it would be perfectly fine if the provider, you know, um, has potential oversight on your workloads. They can modify or read. They don't care. And and they trust, well, they, they have the contract. They have signed a contract. They know that the providers are trustworthy, of course. But for some regulated sectors, it's more difficult. We uh, we have to, to do more things and we have to do oversight um, on our providers in general and the cloud provider in particular. Well, not in particular, but they are just providers like any other kind of outsourcers. So um, we have to find measures and, and, and mitigations to protect, again, potential, of course, uh, access from the provider uh, because of uh, uh, maybe the, the uh, they have uh, been compromised, which is unlikely, but who knows? We, we, we've seen uh, in the past that they, are, they have critical vulnerabilities, so it's possible. Or because maybe they, they, have, uh, uh, they have made an execution error uh, or whatever, you know? So, so that's the point, to protect ourselves uh, against potential uh, provider uh, intrusion. I guess, I guess it's that assume, assume breach mindset, the kind of zero mm -hmm. trust mindset applied to the server side. I mean, a lot of zero trust is about not really protect no, not trusting the, the client yeah. that's connecting to the service but this is flipped around the other way isn't it it's kind of not even trusting the provider or the infrastructure underlying what you're yes you're exactly about. you know that the zero trust yeah one of the most main uh, zero trust tenets is to say that we we are going to break the castle and moat model yep. and replace the firewalls with uh, identity based for example uh, protections and here we it's it's the, the, the return of the jedi it's a return of castle and moats because uh, cloud config confidential computing does exactly this it's it's it's, it's a castle around your workload somehow uh, so it, it has to be for very purpose built use cases honestly yeah but, they're kind of outposts aren't they yeah. rather than rather than we build a big castle we'll have one of them and it's going to control a whole swathe of land we're going yeah. to have lots of little towers and yeah. those towers are going to secure the specific things we need to secure like a bridge here or a particular kind of resource there so i think that that's um 
it's a kind of dialectic, isn't it? it sort of comes back yeah. around. We've got the same model, but it's applied in a new way, in a new context. And sort of zero trust makes space for that uh, to exist as a as a new architecture. And so, what uh, we've, you've talked about this being useful for regul regulated environments. So let's drill down into that a little bit. Is that from a kind of customer sort of privacy uh, legislation perspective? Is it from a, I, I guess, kind of, I guess you've touched on the sort of assumed breach. So, kind of, you know, the, the, I guess that's mitigating risk of. Um, of supply chain attack, maybe, or or other infrastructure kind of risks. But what what other kind of use cases do you see kind of confidential computing be, being being useful? Uh, it's, it's, I think that it's mostly for me uh, a, a matter of uh, of regulation. I don't see really uh, use cases where you would be uh, mandated to use confidential computing outside of regulation because. Uh, uh, unless maybe you're a, a, a military agency or stuff like that. But, uh, okay. Well, I suppose if you're very sensitive about your intellectual property, perhaps, maybe, is that, a, is that another, does, does that help in any way, kind of protect your trade secrets or kind of uh, intellectual property from, um, from the cloud provider? So say you are, um, so I guess if you're a retailer and you're running on AWS, I guess there's always this fear that Amazon could potentially kind of, use your IP against you. Uh, I know mm. that's probably a very paranoid sort of stance to take, but I don't know, say you had some kind of new algorithm, um, is confidential commuting a way to kind of keep that safe or is, or is that just a, a, a false expectation that that might help? Do you mind if I comment on that? Because I, I yeah. think that's a, the, for, for a lot of yeah, use cases, that's, I think, I, sorry, I'm a metaphor person. I think of that as a horse you can chase around the field. Okay, okay. Like, mm. so a lot, of, a lot of those cases, um, where, for example, you've got sort of Amazon might steal your IP. Okay, cool. I can take Amazon to court. I can trash their reputation. That, that's that, that's a high cost activity for them to do. Uh, that like, and when you look at it in terms of the the threat model, and you might I might I can analyze uh, how you'd attack your organization to create that kind of industrial espionage. It's probably a lot harder to do that than it is to threaten one of your engineers, for example. So, like in terms of how that that, that that's kind of a thing that you can account for. I think for some very limited number of workloads, like highly uh, security sensitive secret workloads, um, workloads where if it gets out, you simply cannot do anything about it. Like it's actually, it's all on you and it's too late. Uh, I think that's probably where this kind of technology comes in. But as I said earlier, I don't know, Christoph, if you agree, like I see this becoming part of just the magic of the underlying layer mm -hmm. that, yeah. that it just becomes part foundationally of what I expect to be able to tick a box to switch on. And it might cost me a little bit of a performance penalty or a tiny bit of a cost penalty, but full workflows where I'm dealing with data that I am interested in keeping the integrity of and, and confidentiality of that I'll just tick that box. Um, and I won't think about it again. And there's just like a node that gets deleted from, from the attack tree as it were. Yes, I agree. I think in a few years, uh, all, all workloads will be confidential, either, whether you, you want it or not. It will be by design and the provider will run its own workloads uh, confidentially. But to, to get back for a few seconds on intellectual property, uh, I think there is one case where confidential computing is, um, can, could be useful. It is if there is a conflict of interest between, your, uh, between Amazon, for example, or Azure and, 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 and the customer. For example, if you are a bank and, and if, uh, if Microsoft decides to, to, be, to become a bank or Amazon decides to become a bank, then it could be a problem uh, and you have a conflict of interest. And it might, that might be an interesting way to, to deal with the problem. I guess that was kind of what I was touching on with the sort of retailer use case, really. Um, but I think, I think most people's answer to that in retail is just not to use Amazon at all. Um, that seems to be the general um, view I've seen of, of, of that particular industry. Um, but let's get back to your, your diagram because there's some interesting terminology on there. So the anoxic system is, mm. um, is not a term I come across before, but I like what you said that it's effectively a, a system that only allows a certain type of species to survive. Is, 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 that, is that right? Uh, yes, yes. I, actually, I, I'm not very happy with the name. Uh, right. I, I think we need to find some... some, uh, some there is, there, uh, there is a, a concept that needs to be, uh, to be highlighted, I think. Uh, I don't know, first, if everybody is aware and comfortable with the notion of uh, hermetic system, which, which already exists. I'm not too sure. No, no, uh, let, let, let's start there, because, yeah, no, yeah. I, it's, again, another term that I hadn't come across before. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it, it was coined by uh, AWS security guys. And um, this is how they, 
they look at uh, how to protect their workloads and how to to seal their workload completely from off from uh, their own employees. Uh, of course, they leverage uh, the nitro and claves and all the, the wonderful stuff that they've been uh, working on over the past uh, ten years or so. And so they, they, I think they coined the, 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 this notion, uh, and the and a hermetic system is completely uh, sealed off, right? Uh, nobody can get in except your, the code, um, and this is the basic idea. Yeah. But I think that uh, it is really uh, something that if, if we really have uh, confidential workloads to, to, to run, uh, it's, it's, it's a perfect, uh, it's a perfect uh, setup, uh, hermetic system. How does this compare, I suppose, I suppose in old world terms, to an air gap system? Okay. Yeah, it's 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 the idea. It's yeah, it's, it's an archive system, you're right. Uh, but it's by design, uh, completely by design. On the hardware part, uh, you are completely uh, completely blocked to, and prevented to 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 access the uh, the VM or the uh, the compute environment. You know that cloud providers have access potentially to, to the cloud VMs. Uh, when they do so, it is always very exceptional and uh, there are procedures to, to follow. They are being monitored. They have to have just-in-time access and all, all kinds of measures. But yeah, Amazon wants to go one step further. They have matured in automation uh, and uh, uh, troubleshooting is exceptional now. So, so this is, I think it's a good trend and uh, all cloud providers will fo follow this trend. But for customers, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Pardon me. Yeah, I was, and this is what you would uh, describe as no ops. I see in some of your blog posts, yeah. you'll talk about the sort of the no ops transition from I'm operating this server on behalf of the customer to my bots are operating this server on behalf of the customer. And I can't tell my bots to do anything except for this limited API. Exactly. So, but it's very difficult to reach for when you are a customer at this level of maturity. Uh, first, you, you have to troubleshoot a lot. You're never confident that your uh, uh, your workloads work at, as expected. In production, you want to be able to jump in in case of a major incident. Uh, so, we are far behind, of course, the providers, uh, and it will take a long time to uh, to get this level. And I think that anoxic systems, or well, uh, this, this kind of system is an intermediate way. Um, uh, it, it's a goal that we should, if we want to run a confidential workload, we, we should aim at, uh, at anoxic systems where customers are completely free to, uh, to access their uh, compute systems while the provider is completely blocked. This is the basic IT. So ops, if there are ops in the system, it's a customer ops and a zero ops from the provider. Uh, by design, yeah, that's the idea globally. And this, I, I suppose, naturally and, and conveniently moves us on to the shared responsibility model piece that I wanted to, to get into mm -hmm. because it's interesting now because we're starting potentially to eat away at some of the value that going to the cloud provides, right? I, I go to the cloud, I, I no longer have to care about certain sort of things. That's at least the notion that a lot of people have, right? I think this is starting to kind of get more nuanced because as more and more workloads shift to the cloud, of course, we need other models to kind of, uh, as, as we've already touched on, sort of deal and mitigate with some of the risks that moving to the cloud presents for certain situations. But, you know, it's interesting here, with, there's a, as always in, in architecture, it's a trade-off, isn't it? And it, it depends. But mm -hmm. I suppose as we sort of step into these different sort of systems, we are losing, I suppose, some of the value that we get from outsourcing the infrastructure layer, I suppose, to another party. Well, you know, um, it depends whether you talk uh, confidential VMs or on, on clouds. I don't know how you say in English, in on cloud, right? On, 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 on cloud, on, 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 on cloud, cloud, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah on cloud, fine, so, yeah. So, yeah, okay, Th same, thanks. So, on clouds for me are, um, are eating away uh, the business value because uh, you have to use specific interactions to code your what's going on in the on cloud. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of memory uh, and it's, it's, it's a very, very burdensome and cumbersome for, for developers to use. Confidential VMs are different uh, because it's a native experience of the VM. Uh, so it's, it's, it's similar to IaaS in terms of business value. But what I'm uh, working on now, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the next step, it is a platform as a service, of course. And you know that we have confidential containers now which are being developed and, uh, uh, by the, uh, uh, the Kata containers uh, stuff. Uh, the idea is to run confidential com uh, 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 workloads into containers, into platform as a service. And we have to, it's, we are at the key, uh, key milestone, I think, now, uh, because we want to, 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 to get the best of two worlds, right? We, we want to have the business value and have the security at the same time. And at, at the moment, we don't, right? It's a critical time to, 
to step in, I think. Uh, and um, I think the way, personally, the way to, to, to solve this, uh, this contradiction is to remove all provider activity from, uh, from the workload, which doesn't mean that there is no more provider activity. No, it is just uh, outside of the workload. So we, in terms of uh, cloud shared responsibility model, uh, within the confidential workload, you will have only the customer and uh, the chip maker. I, will, I, I hope I will have time to cover this in a second. But it does, outside, you still have this huge uh, uh, engine, this huge platform, which is running the, the confidential workload in a managed way. And it is tricky to do because uh, uh, all the, the smartness of the cloud must remain outside, but be sufficiently smart to interact with your workload so that you don't have much to think about except your code. You know, mm -hmm. it's a difficult equation to solve, but uh, we have good hopes to, to solve it. No, I was absolutely going to come on to the, 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 the chip make because that was the bit when you shared the impact on the cloud shared responsibility model. The post, well, I think it was one of the first posts that I, that I then sort of said, oh, Christoph, we should talk about this some more. I'd love to explain, hear you explain it. And there, that's what really yeah, got me curious. It's like you've got the cloud of today has two actors in the responsibility model, essentially customers and cloud service providers. But you're saying the cloud of tomorrow will have three actors. It will have mm -hmm. customers, cloud service provider bots, which touches on what Pete was saying earlier, that will have some automation from the cloud service provider, plus chip maker bots. So this is another diagram which, in the edit, I'll, I'll, I'll include the picture so people can see it. Virtualization was uh, was created in the 70s, in the early 70s. For 40 years, uh, all the virtualized systems were based on the theory that was uh, that was mathematical theory behind virtualization of the 70s. And it, the system were all based on that model. Uh, and we took it for granted. Uh, the, uh, um, the supervisor, what we call the supervisor in the VM, is trusted, fully trusted in this model, right? Mm -hmm. Trust the supervisor. And if we translate that in today's world of cloud computing, it means that the provider is fully trusted because the provider owns and manages a hypervisor. So now what's interesting with confidential computing uh, is that for 10 years now, we have a, a really disruptive change in this model because, um, uh, so we had for 40 years this model and now we have a new actor, uh, the chip maker itself, who is able to uh, uh, protect uh, the guest from the host, right? Mm -hmm. In a way that uh, even the host itself cannot prevent somehow. Uh, and um, at the moment, it's purely hardware, right? The processor uh, does this on behalf of uh, well, the whole platform, let's say. Uh, it offers already tremendous value because it protects memory, protects the registers, and uh, and but it has to be accounted for. It is a new actor. It's a new actor in the cultural responsibility model. Uh, um, it is uh, independent from the provider. It's independent for the customer. It, it looks like a PKI, right? Okay. Where you have a customer, you have uh, Alice and Bob, right? Who wants to share the information, and then you have the trusted authority above all. So you can take the processor as a trusted authority, and and you have the provider and the and the customers are, are as consumers of this uh, relationship. You see, so say if the provider becomes Mallory in this case, um, mm. AWS or someone acting within AWS, uh, then what's to compromise the system? Alice and Bob's communications are secure because you know, I guess it's, well, who is it? Trent is uh, is is the chip maker in this instance, right? So. It's interesting because Amazon have gone down the route of making the chips themselves, right? So they've got their uh, Annapurna fab fabrication, right? So, yeah. which is which is their own subsidiary. So, in a way, they've kind of they're being Trent to protect the other side of themselves from Mallory. Does that actually work for you? Uh, honestly, for me, uh, uh, what Amazon has done is it's just wonderful. It's it's, it's, it's in, in terms of security, it's really state of the art. Uh, as far as it looks from the uh, an external perspective, but for me this model is not uh, the model. Uh, me as a customer personally, I, I could uh, embrace as of today, um, because uh, because of the fact that they have still uh, well they have of course purchased and open labs, but uh, all the security is based on the assumption that uh, the bad guy is uh, is a customer, right? Uh, an arbitrary customer. Uh, they have never thought, or maybe they have thought, but they don't want to deal with the fact that the bad guy could be the provider itself, right? And that, that is a problem for me because the core issue I have to deal with is provider 
comp compromission or co provider misbehavior. It's interesting because where I was kind of going next was, you know, we've seen attacks uh, or mm -hmm. vulnerabilities, I should say, sorry, found at the sort of processor level. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, does the, the sort of chip maker no ops present sort of another area where things could go wrong in the future? Yes, exactly. That's a, that's, that's a new area where things could go wrong. And, and I think that, you know, this technology is very, very young, right? Yeah. Uh, Intel uh, has uh, made the equivalent of uh, this confidential VM. They released their TDX, I think it's called. I've not uh, time to, to look into this, but I will definitely. It's, it's, it's a competitor of uh, AMD SMP, right? Um, and so it's very, very new. New. even AMD technology is very new so so of course when the technology is new it's prone to more uh, vulnerabilities it's very complex if you think about how the how many things the processor has to manage now uh, so it's it's hugely complex and it's not always the specifications of the uh, of the hardware uh, vendors and stuff is not always very clear and transparent to be honest so it's a it's a it's a field of in investigation by many researchers and we need more transparency, we need more audits, we need more pen testing, pen testing, crypt analysis of the hardware. Definitely, uh, we see that there are too many vulnerabilities at, uh, at the moment, but of course, it's, it's, a, yeah, it's a useful mistake, I would say. They will grow up and in time, and it's just uh, the order of things. They will, will be more mature and, and robust over time. Yeah. Do you uh, think that there's a role here for, for standards as well? You mentioned earlier, uh, the sort of customers getting involved more. And I think where we've seen uh, really r robust standards uh, emerge in areas like identity, uh, for example, um, it's been where customers have got involved in the standards definition process and the adoption process. Um, whereas this, as you say, is very, very vendor side, um, uh, fabricator side uh, and chips, or SGX, I think from, from Intel, is like internally and internally Intel, Intel project. It's good. Here you go, the world, here's the new mm -hmm. instruction set. <laughs> exactly. Um, and I, and I sort of wonder that uh, over time, whether you think that the seeds are being sown for the kind of collaboration that would lead to some standards around this, which would give maybe some more robustness or whether you think that's just unexplored and uh, maybe a risk it doesn't happen. I think it's it's open, it's still open because um, providers, it's, it's no, I, I, they've, they've been doing things, they've, they've changed things. You look at the Intel, they were entirely focused on enclaves, now they, they understand that uh, the business model is more geared toward uh, confidential VMs. Uh, AMD proceeds through clever steps. If you see, they, they are the SCP first, now SNP. Uh, attestations uh, is also uh, a big deal, uh, a big potential issue as well. I, I won't have time to cover it, but I think they're open to, to discussions, they're open to standardization, and uh, people are actually working on standards now. Not only the hardware vendors, but uh, other members of the uh, confidential co community uh, uh, contribute heavily to the standards. So I think it will evolve. Uh, the only thing that's missing is a customer voice for me. So I'm going to move. I'm going to move us towards sort of summarizing where 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 we are on this. And I think um, you've said it already, Christoph. It's it's not for everyone. My reflections increasingly on cloud are, uh, you know, it's getting increasingly complicated. I mean, I look at the number of cloud services now and it's bewildering, right? I think for the average person now to adopt cloud uh, or kind of go on that cloud learning journey, it's, yeah, initial initial steps. You can get your credit card out and start procuring services, but this you know, the, 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 the nuance now in the type of service, how you configure it, is it secure by default or do you need to kind of go and harden it? And uh, you know, what are the different considerations? It, it's getting pretty complex, right? I, I've lost count now of, what the latest mm -hmm. count of the cloud services are on one of the providers, for example. But it, it, where, where I guess, where do you sort of see this in the mix of of, of the various different options people have around cloud security? Uh, I, I think that yes, since the services are, are getting more and more complex, I, I don't think for the customers it's that complicated. But uh, it's going to be in terms of uh, using the services and securing the services as part of their share of the responsibility model. Uh, but uh, the complexity of the services and the fact that they look more and more like uh, SaaS yeah. means that they are going to be there is a big big risk here that. Uh, uh, it, it multiplies exponentially the number of potential uh, flows, right? But it's more uh, a problem of the provider than the customer for me. Right. So I guess ultimately this is trying to sort of shift some of the, the kind of concern uh, back towards the provider, but 
there are yeah there are nuances that we've kind of gone through so building on that that kind of idea about what it means for the customer versus the provider so look coming from customer side if i start to be able to deploy nitro instances with fargate and just not think about it and i've just my my, my work is just happening in these conf confidential vms that's cool uh, and again it comes down to price price sensitivity <laughs> and and uh uh performance sensitivity for the customer well, those are highly performant um, and probably won't be that expensive, I guess. That, 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 that will be that will just be part of how you do things. For customers right now, for the industry right now, I think a lot of organizations have done a digital trans transformation. A lot of organizations now look at their estate and go, oh heck, I've got like all of these different things running everywhere. We're supposed to be doing zero trust. Zero trust isn't supposed to mean I literally can't trust anything, but I think some <laughs> organizations that I work with are certainly in a, in a, in a, in a place where they're um yeah they're trying to put it all together just to get the basics okay so you know your classics of build chain supply chain kind of risks the, the things that are going to hurt you uh, every day so as sort of Christopher sort of alludes so I think this is something that's happening at the, the vendor level the hardware level uh, but I'm I do think it has a positive foundational impact on the underlying cloud security as we talk about those sort of there's sort a of little tower outposts you know over time this starts to just add better security to to the things you're doing within those cloud zero trust architectures becomes part of the longer term solution to some of those uh, issues that you feel now. Yes, completely agree. And look, th thanks both of you. Um, those listening, do go and check out Christoph on LinkedIn. He posts pretty regularly, very insightful things about cloud security. So do, do go and follow thanks. Christoph if you aren't already. Um, and look, th thanks both of you for your time. It's been a really good sort of deep dive into a particular aspect of, of cloud security. So. Um, Thank you. And um, yeah, look, that leads me to say, well, look, if you're not already subscribing to Architect Tomorrow, please do uh, do check out the other content. We've touched on threat uh, modeling, for example, uh, a few episodes a, a, a while ago, but that was certainly a good one on kind of the security topic. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in talking uh, security, cloud security, security architecture, please do get in touch. I'd like to cover uh, this again uh, later this year as well. So with that, thanks very much, both of you. And uh, yeah. Look forward to seeing uh, everyone soon. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot Sally. for your time and for the invitation. Thanks. Likewise. Thank you.